Yeah, thanks for coming. I just wanted to add to that um, introduction, Marcel. Um, I just wanted to, to make t for you to take note of um, his momentous award-winning, the, the, the momentous award-winning trajectory of his career. You know, he won the Somerset Mom Award, a finalist for the U.S. National Book Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and he was the, the winner of the the pre. The pr yeah, the pre de la inaperçu. Inaperçu. I speak. French like a Spanish cow, um, and which has been won by three other Cre three Koreans, you know, Bi Feu, um, Kim Aran, and and Kim uh, Shin Kyung Suk. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. It's sort of a pri it's a prize for the you know the person who didn't get no. It's the best book that didn't get noticed. It's the sort no. of uh, no. Sort of, but I, but it, I mean I'm very proud to well, have won it. Well, these are very you know es established and very highly highly regarded um, novelists oh, in, okay. in in Korea. Um, and uh, you've also won the John W. Campbell Award, which is a very prestigious award for writers of SF, um, whose past winners have included an illustrious list of writers such as Christopher Priest, Ian MacDonald, Cory Doctorow, Richard Morgan, Frederick Pohl, Brian Aldous, Michael Moorcock, King Kingsley Amos, uh, Philip K. Dick, and Arthur C. Clarke. And I must say, before we begin, that I have watched Marcel's reaction to the regular questions he receives about his father. And uh, Marcel, you're very good natured when people ask you about him. And perhaps it is a mark of your confidence, um, for it is clear that you have surpassed him as a writer. Well, that's and it I is, don't know if he'd you know, agree. It is a mark of your good grace that you allow us to discover this for ourselves. Um, well, thank you. Uh, it's funny about the prizes. I sometimes wonder, w would you rather win a prize or be a bestseller? And I think, to be honest, I would <laughs> rather, I'd rather have the acclaim of readers. Uh -huh. I, I think prizes are really, really important for writers because... Mm. Uh, you know, in a, in a very crowded market, they direct people's attention to books. They give you a measure of validation that you wouldn't otherwise get. They make a miserable day somewhat better if you get a nice call. So for all these reasons, they're great things. But also, they're kind of beauty contests. You know, the effect of being a finalist and not winning is, uh, you know, one person feels great, five people feel terrible. Uh, you know, so so I, there is a questionable value about them, but I'm very very grateful for for, for the. But I, I, you know, I think ultimately, one w w wants to be one wants to connect with readers. Of course, you want to sell as many books as possible, and you know it is all cumulative. Though the more prizes you win, the more coverage you get. The more coverage you get, you know, you, we hope you get more readers, and you know it's just a cumulative cumulative thing. You're very young still, so you know it will all happen. I mean. I want to talk about now about Strange Bodies. Sure. Shall we move to that? Yeah, um, that's, that's my mo most recent novel. Your most recent novel. Um, and uh, shall we start with kind of telling people about the book itself? Sort of imagine falling asleep perhaps on your deathbed, uh, <laughs> thinking possibly with some relief that you'll never wake again. Um, but then one day, Rip Van Winkle-esque, uh, uh, imagine that you've been torn awake, not just two decades later, as in the, Rip Van, uh, the Washington Irving short story, but over two centuries later, into a multiplex, you know, technicolor world, complete with new language, a new posture, a new way of being. And, and you know, where are you? Uh, and who is who? And, and who, who, who or what? And who are you? Um, what's an iPhone or a landline, a beer, a toaster, you know, a metal bird that roars through the, sc through the air? And, um, oops, let me just scroll down here. And, and, and most importantly, what is this language that people are speaking? And, and why can't they understand me when everything around you seems familiar, but at the same time, utterly different? How did you get here and, and how can you go back? And that is where Strange Bodies takes us, at first through a kind of circuitous route, just long enough to help us move towards that wonderful state where we readers are so involved in the story, in the life of the character telling us the story, that we are 100% prepared to suspend our disbelief. Um, indeed, you know, as you say in the book, humankind cannot bear much reality. Um, and though this novel talks to us about um, Hold on. Uh, about agelessness, about the search for life after death, as it were, to reduce it to that would be to say that the political situation in, in Bangladesh is all about religion, and then leave it at that. Mm. You know, no, this this book is is um, far more complicated and complex, and infused with subtleties. Um, and in the case of um, a Strange Bodies, so many literary references unfolding as intricate as an origami flower, says James Glake of the New York Review of Books. That was nice. Isn't that nice? I hope no one gets put off. If I, someone told me a book is studied with literary references, I might put that to read much later. No, but it's, <laughs> it's really, uh, yeah, it's really wonderful. Kind of challenges us, as, us in, in, the, in the nicest way. So, so on one level, this book is, uh, is a book about the meaning of life and death. And on another, it is about the meaning of consciousness and language and self-determinism about the perception of reality. 
And I, I spoke to Marcel yesterday, and we'll, we'll start opening up the, the conversation sure. now. And, and you, you said um, that you, you were wanting, you, you quoted the, you re, re quoted the, the, the Milton uh, extract. Oh, the, God, I can't find it now. That's right. Books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them. I was interested in writing, a, I was interested about people coming back from the dead. I always thought it would be cool to begin a book with a line that said, so and so, the trouble started when so and so came back from the dead. And I'm interested in books about where characters either literally or metaphorically come back from the dead. Um, there's that amazing book, The Return of Martin Guerre by Natalie Zemon Davis, which was made into a film called Summersby, uh, starring Richard Gere, in which a man comes back, a seemingly dead man comes back from the war and, uh, and encounters his wife and they go on to have a much better relationship than he did before he left for the war. Of course, he, doesn't, he isn't literally back from the dead. It turns out that he's a stranger pretending to be the dead man. And uh, so in order to bring someone back from the dead, uh, I was, I was uh, confronted with a technical difficulty of how it might be that we might cheat death. And I was, uh, for a lot of my life, I've been thinking about this line from Milton that says, books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them. And the idea that Milton has is that books have a, a kind of consciousness, that they're the distillation of a person, the person who wrote them. And I think everyone in this tent who's a reader will have had the feeling of reading a book and the feeling of becoming in touch with the consciousness of the person who wrote that. That could be a religious book, it could be a fiction, it could be non-fiction, it could be a history book. But you get, in the best books and the best poems, you get a distinct sense of the personality of the author. And as the book becomes part of you, I think that person becomes part of you, in a sense. So, in the, uh, so at the heart of my book is a, is a fictional procedure which takes the words of a dead person and translates them into a kind of uh, computer code or algorithms and distills the quintessence of that person in a way that could be uh, transferred in, into another person. And that sounds like sci-fi mumbo-jumbo. It is in a way, but it's a, what we happens when we read. I mean, this is what I was saying. You, you, know, you, you read it and you're so far into the novel that then all of a sudden you, you understand what's going on and you're, so, you're, you're into it and you suspend your disbelief there. It's a little bit like the Kolimsky code where, where you know, this, this character is, you know, can do all kinds of you know, uh, um, super technical things and you know, uh, beyond human you know, uh, yes. uh, uh, um, Kolimsky Heights by Lionel Heights, Davidson. That's right, yeah. I so, think, yeah, well, I think for me the themes always come second. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, I want to... I have an initial setup, a first line mm. maybe that intrigues me or a situation that intrigues me. And then it, I think if you explore something really patiently and uh, you, know, you follow the things that you're interested in, I think themes emerge later. I, I don't, mm. I'm not a, mm. and, and when I look at the book, I, th I think there are themes, but they're not things that I, at least not in the first draft, consciously attempted to put in. Yeah, you were saying the other day that um, you didn't realise how much of Edgar Allan Poe has influenced you and it's how terrible, you know, books as it? readers sort of imprint their souls on ours, so to speak, right? And, and and the, because it's also the way you think. Uh, the way you think, the language you use, is the ideas you have, the images that become part of your imagination. And I think the, da the danger is you read really bad books. It, it does, uh, it, 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 it afflicts, probably not permanent... And is it, what do I mean by bad? Not necessarily bad, I don't know, morally bad, bad writing. I mean, that's, it clo kind of closes down your imagination. And, I, and, and Kelly's right, I had this realization when I reread some Edgar Allan Poe that I probably read far too much of it as a young person. And there were, and Poe is terrible for using weird words, weird Latinate words that not <laughs> subsequently used. I sometimes have to prune them out of my own writing. Yeah, I mean, I think when I started when I started to read this book, I was thinking of other books as well that have that have influenced me and that that brought um, an, an, another kind of level of understand my understanding to this to this book. Because I was thinking of you know Schrodinger's cat and M. John Harrison's Light, another you know very highly regarded SF novel. Um, and the the, the um, in in terms of Schrodinger's cat, can there be two 
can can the cat be alive and dead at the same time? Right. And, and 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 a perception of reality is is the cat alive because we see it or because we know it's alive in the box? And what gives it life? And and um, that's well, just one. I mean, that isn't about language making the cat alive. About our belief in whether or not the yes. cat is alive. Um, and also. Yeah, I was just thinking that's true, and that, that that's one of the issues in the book is that if you did happen to come back from, if you were as uh, unfortunate enough to to come back from the dead, and not in your own body, as happens to a couple of characters in this book, is it would it still be you? Are you thinkable with your memories in another body? Mm. Uh, I think that's one of the... Th uh, because to me, I feel like people focus on the idea of uh, our consciousness as in hearing in our minds. Uh, and I always am drawn to that miraculous experience that we all have when you lie in the bath and you look or you're on a beach or sit in a chair and you look at your feet and you think, oh, my goodness, those belong to me. That, that I'm in here looking at my feet... That, uh, and you have this illusion that you're a homunculus in your own brain. And I think that is an illusion because so I think to an extent we are our entire bodies and that a brain with a different, uh, a brain with a different liver, different hands, different appendix, different knees. Well, there's a, there's a great line in the, in the book where, um, I can't give too much away, but the character well, we can, comes... we might have to risk a few plot comes spoilers. Back and he's, uh, one of the characters comes back, say, and he's in a different body. And he still has the memories of his old self, but, it, but he looks down at his hands and he says, but, and his, his, his legs, and he says, but these aren't the hands that held my child, my son, and uh, my memories of him are different, and they're not, you know, kind of tactile in that way, because yeah. I can't, so I don't have that, that same memory. I have a different memory of my son, but it's still as real as the other memory. It's just a different one, a different interpretation of the one yes. that I had. The, um, James Gleick, in the, that re nice review you mm. quoted from, said that he said he had a great line, which I wish I thought of about, he said that the, the, the self uh. is a story we tell. Yes, I quoted and, that. And I thought that's such a yeah. terrific way of yeah. thinking about the, uh, the, the, the self is a story. And because we're not, I don't think any of us are, are, are fully coherent. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, only, we have integrity insofar as we inhabit a single body. But on a different day, depending on whether you've had a good night's sleep or a bad night's sleep, whether you've eaten or haven't eaten, whether someone's been nice to you or someone's been rude to you, you, you can find yourself having wildly different reactions to yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, like said, um, oh, this QB thing, um, novelists are in the business of constructing consciousness out of words, and that's what we all do, cradle to grave. The self is a story we tell. And I suppose, you know, this gets into kind of pop psychology, you know, you can change your perception of, you know, of your life by, you know, thinking positive thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's, it's, an in, it's an idea that I'm very interested in now, uh, taking on to its next logical conclusion, which is that if beyond the self, maybe the the world we inhabit is a sh story we tell, and you know, I think in a country, you know, e even in a country, uh, in a country like Bangladesh, which has a contested history, the the struggle of who to, who creates the story of the nation, what is the nation, what is what integrity does it have, is a is a perpetual negotiation among the interested parties. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a very interesting story about the stories w nations tell about themselves. I mean, you, you've been to Japan, I don't know if you've been to Hiroshima, and you've been to the museum to there, and, you know, there's a, there's a line there which a lot of foreigners quote is, um, the, Jap the Japanese were, uh, uh, it was an unprovoked attack on, on the Japanese, the, the, the atom bomb, and um, that they attacked a, a school full of, full of children. And, and, you know, because the Japanese have constructed this, you know, this post-war... Um, story about you know why they were bombed but this this was one the story they constructed immediately after if you read you know John Hersey's Hiroshima you'll see that they were fully aware of what was going on it was a total war and you know they were they felt responsible and they said if you're in a war then this is what happens you know it's bad but you know we've con we've done other things to bad people but now you know years and years later they've reconstructed the story and reconstructed the story of themselves we're all at it though Kelly aren't yeah. we we're all at it it's, is it is it the great mutiny or the great uprising you know is it uh, uh, and, and is it the the rape of Nanjing, or you know how 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 are the history books supposed to? And history is the great kind of narrative. You know, at its worst, it's just a it's a, it's just it's it uses a, it passes itself off as reality. And re 
And really, I think that the forms of fiction are, uh, you see them everywhere, in the p way people tell stories, in the way people describe how they went into business, how they succeeded in business. They're all after the fact justification yeah. after the fact and, and creating the hero of the story aren't they as well the and self I as the protagonist it, things would could never have turned out differently and uh, so i think so that's uh, that's sort of what i'm interested in, uh, that's something i'm very interested in now and thinking about is that you know that things could have been so different just with, with, with a, add a, t a tiny change to global events and w w the world we live in would have been Utterly, unimaginably different. You, you talk about, um, in the book, uh, Tolstoy. You know, what if Tolstoy, we talked about this yesterday, what, what if Tolstoy came back to life? At what point in his life would he be brought back? And, you know, what, what, what is the best... Well, he's su but Tolstoy, the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, is such, an Im such a remarkable uh, individual. In fact, there was, there's a talk on Gandhi uh, today, D Gandhi before... It, in before India, uh, Gandhi was a big Tolstoyan. Uh, arguably, Tolstoy had the biggest intellectual uh, impact on him of anyone. Uh, but, but but which Tolstoy? I mean, Tolstoy in later in later life was a vegetarian, pacifist, bearded guru who was interested in uh, Eastern philosophy and made his own shoes very badly. I might add, people thought that, that he never successfully made a pair of shoes, but he kind of insisted on making them, cobbling them himself to his wife's utter dismay because she wanted to leave a kind of decent rural life and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, she was a member of the Russian nobility and got very fed up with preparing him vegetarian meals which were short on protein so she had to keep on thinking of ways of slipping a bit more cheese into his food so he wouldn't weaken. But that was only one version of Tolstoy. Tolstoy, had you met him 30 years earlier, was a swaggering young noble who was uh, in the Russian Imperial Army, uh, enjoyed uh, sleeping with his uh, the serfs who were on his property, a father to child with a, a, a serf, a peasant woman who, with whom he claimed to be very much in love. So, so who's Tolstoy? If you bring him, who do you get? If you if you bring him back, these two uh, irreconcilable paradox. These are contradictions that you could never, only in the course of an entire lifetime, could you possibly have a, a, a figure like that experience those two. And, and who decides, right? Who decides which which Tolstoy is brought back? This is a, one of the moral dilemmas of the book. You know, who makes the code? You know, Vera in the book is the that's code. That's right. How, um, do, you, how do you choose? How, how do you bring them back? And and and, and in, in life, you know, you tend to, if there's someone you love, you you make allowances for them too. You overemphasize. You emphasize. Give emphasis to the good stuff. De-emphasize the bad stuff. And in writers, you like you do the same thing. You you think of early Wordsworth poetry, which you like, and then you think of the. Uh, the bo the boring later stuff and you you can that seems to count for much less you know or the you know or in a more uh, kind of pop culture ever you think of the rolling stones i mean who li who cares about the later albums at all you know the, as far as you know if they stop recording at the end of the 1970s would it have made a would it make a difference you know not. And who, who did the Rolling Stones steal from as well? I want to hear the original versions, you know, well, in the deep exactly south. Well, that's exactly right. right. They're a, that's right. They're a Mississippi blues tribute act, yeah, really. Yeah, actually. And I was thinking, when I read this book, um, I was thinking of, uh, of course, M. John Harrison's Light and Frankenstein, as I said the other day. It, it because is. there's a real gothic kind of feeling of the, of the book, when it, when it, the style of it initially. I think if you choose to bring someone back from the dead, you're pretty much, you're, genre, you're either just trying to found a new religion, or you writing uh, something somewhat gothic or sci-fi. And, and that's how I found myself writing a science fiction book after growing up thinking that science fiction was a kind of disreputable genre. And so I, uh, I uh, you know, if, if you could try to use science to perform a miracle or make a miracle plausible, uh, that, that then the genre is, of the book is kind of chosen, chosen for you. Yeah, I mean, SF has had a bad rap, and I think, uh, you know, some of the finest writers of our generation... Have you generation always been an SF fan? No, I haven't. I mean, I've only read a little bit of SF, and there are other people who are like, you know, they but know it backwards But I think forwards, that's intimidating. You see, I uh. think there's, a, there's an intimidating... I think there's a, you, you know, both... Uh, you know, there's, there's this false divide between literary fiction and sci-fi, and mm. both sides guard their territory very jealously, and... Mm. Uh,
John Mullen was very dismissive. Uh, John Mullen, a literary critic in the UK, very been very dismissive in the past about science fiction. But equally, science fiction writers can be very hostile about a literary, so quote unquote, author who's setting up camp in a sci-fi. Yeah, they are a bit clicky, and they um, are, yeah, yeah. And, the, and it isn't sci-fi, by the way. It's SF. I was I was reprimanded by this girl I work with at really? Galance, and um, what's she, the distinction? I don't know, but it just I get just, uh, the sound of it or something. I don't, I never really you know fell upon I the, see. the, so the. I think the it's really tiresome reason. that people put police the, jo the the boundaries of the genre in, in this way, and yeah. um, I believe I in miscegenation. I was thinking about also when I was reading this book, this quote from, I'm not religious, but this quote from um, uh, the Bible, John, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. And I think that really, you know. But I think that, you know, there's a lot of people, well, obviously there's a lot of people coming back from the dead. Uh, it, well, th th more than a few in the New oh, Testament. Yeah, right. But I, but I, and I think in a Gnostic, you know, the Gnostics were this, uh, there was this tendency within Christianity that got what happened to the Gnostics? They kind of they kind of lost actually in history. They became the historical also rans. But for the Gnostics, re, uh, resurrection from the dead was also metaphorical, and it was the sense of uh, awaking into your real life and into a real understanding of the world. And I suppose that one of the things that I, I became interested in was uh, was authenticity. Was that in in a you know, when are you, I mean, we all have this sense, I think, sometimes that we're more fully alive at certain times than at others. And at certain times, you do your job, you get up, you go to work, you, in a somewhat perfunctory way, and you're not fully engaged with any of it. You, you've, a couple of days, weeks, months passed, and you've not been fully present, maybe, in your body. And at other times, you feel absolutely vital and they have a wonderful connection with nature and with your partner and your colleagues and and then and, and that's when you want to be that's that's real you feel like that's the real me and then of course it's like a sun going behind a cloud you lose that and it's a very very for some people and a very very difficult experience so so i was trying to think well how do you maintain that how do you how do you stay alive i i don't know the art, by the way. I'd be very <laughs> happy if someone could tell I me. I suppose you allow yourself to, you know, experience the ebbs and flows. Um, I wonder. Talk to me a little bit about Nick, because he is a real anti-hero. You He's know, an anti-hero. Yeah. <laughs> Some people. The, the the central character, the one, the, the guy who, the protagonist of the book, the guy who is who is the, telling the story of the book and who's come back from the dead, is an academic called Nicholas Slopen. And he has been asked to authenticate some letters by a, by a dead uh, English writer, Samuel Johnson, who compiled a dictionary in the 18th century. And he's fascinated by these letters because he's realized, he realizes that they're real letters, but he's never seen them before. And he wants to understand how on earth these letters, where they could have come from <coughs> and why he's never seen them. And in trying to understand the origin of the letters, he finds himself getting drawn into this conspiracy, this scientific conspiracy, at the heart of which is an attempt to, to recreate life, to recre or recreate the illusion of life in a in a in a new being. And he, you know, he is a little bit of an ass, uh, I'm afraid. And I, I, you know, I, I was interested also in in seeing whether you, you know whether the Nick who Proceed that you know. There's two Nicky Slopens in the book. There's the guy before he gets uh, reincarnated, and the guy yeah. after. And I think the the miserable process of waking up and finding himself in another body is quite is educational for him. And I think he learns, uh, you know, as crises often are for people that that uh, losing everything. And I think actually arriving in another body would be to lose absolutely everything. That me is meaningful well, to you. He's lost. He has lost. He's lost his wife, who's you know, he's been cuckolded. Um, he his children, who've gone to this other guy, who's you know far richer than he is. He yes. has a chip on his shoulder because he he chose to be an academic and you know he doesn't have a lot of money. And then ultimately, and you know he he has he's a bit wet. You know he doesn't he doesn't seem to be the most courageous guy who you would could depend on in a crisis. Mm. And yet he is depended on in a crisis, isn't he? Yeah. And then he then he ultimately he loses his 
you know, well, he, he he seems to lose his body or whatever. And <laughs> and 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 then then this other Nick looks at him and says to us, the reader. I mean, this is one of the great things about this book is that the, the, um, it's it's infused with hu humor as well. You know, it yeah. kind of lev it leavens it and 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 uh, in places. And and the the his other self looks at him sitting in the front seat of the car and goes, actually, he is a bit of an ass. You <laughs> know. But also, he hears him speaking foreign language and thinks his pronunciation's terrible. Because I was thinking, actually, if you did get to meet, if you did meet yourself, you think, you know, you can't, I, I can't bear hearing your grammatical mistakes. I hate the way you hold a knife and fork. But it's a true thing in life, isn't it? That uh, don't you find that your arguments with your partner uh, tend to be about precisely the things that you loathe most in yourself, and you you project the, all my biggest arguments with people are about the things that actually are <laughs> the things that I'm not reconciled to in myself, my terrible messiness and my. <laughs> You know, yeah. being disorganized. And, and um, so talk to me also about the, um, the, there's a lot of Russian kind of ph philosophy or yeah. science in this, is it philosophy well, and science in this book? You quote Lermontov and... and that's and, right. And a lot, well, I was, because I was trying to figure out a way to bring him back from the dead, and I was interested in, uh, I thought, well, the, the, I knew that the Soviet science had done a lot of the, Soviet science had always been really interested in, uh, what we would regard as dubious areas of study. So during the Cold War, they used things like uh, ESP, they used exercises in remote viewing, you know, they used kind of fortune tellers, they used uh, stuff that we used, wet science would regard as superstition, thinking, well, it's cheap, I think, primarily, and it might give us an advantage in the Cold War if you could figure out where the US is hiding its nuclear weapons or determine who, who's a spy. It's a, it's a low investment. You find a wise woman who claims to be able to determine this stuff and, and they did proper research into this and into very woolly things to do with electromagnetism and mirrors and uh, blood transfusions. Well, the blood oh, that, trans that well, that's well. And then as I looked into this, I, I learned that actually at the, at the beginning of the Soviet Union, there was actually a very, there was a great deal of interest in life after death. And that as a matter of fact, there was a whole Russian, there was a whole Russian scientific tradition, who's now, who, they're now called the Russian Cosmists. And it's where a kind of Russian religion and, uh, and utopian socialism fuse. So in the late part of the 19th century, there was a, a Russian philosopher called Nikolai Fyodorov, who, who's not very well known at all, but who was deeply in, influential on the Bolsheviks, who, who said that the greatest task facing humanity is the physical resurrection of everyone who's ever died and the an eternal life for everyone. And as a corollary of this ambition, he thought we're going to have to colonize other planets because he realized that there was no possibility of everyone living. Earth is too small to accommodate. Well, it's too small to accommodate us, actually. So it's going to be too small to accommodate us plus all our dead ancestors who we're going to bring back. Now, when I say this, it sounds absolutely crazy, doesn't it? I mean, uh, because it's not, um, it's not, in most religions, immortality is a kind of metaphor or it's understood in a kind of sublime way. It's not understood as coming back in this body now and having a relationship with my, you know, sadly departed grandmother. But Fyodorov really meant this literally. He said, you know, it's going to take a long time <laughs> showing that he's had some, you know, limits to his ambition. It's going to take a long time, but this is the, this is the task. This is the common task, the obshir djela, he called it. And then uh, Fyodorov dies in 1903. But this kind of utopian dream, I remember this is also around the time when we, when this this kind of huge, the 19th century faith in science is going strong. Science is going to save us all. It's going to make us all rich. It's going to make work unnecessary. Mm. It's going to make society harmonious. And so there's this huge faith that science w will deliver on the promise one of these days of, of bringing us all back from the dead. And Russians, uh, Russian Bolsheviks start experimenting with things that might prolong life. And one of the things they come up with is blood transfusions. So through the early part of the 19th century, they give each other blood transfusions. Uh, the people who are dabbling in this, they, they take blood, 
inject ourselves with more blood, and they report really good effects. They report that their beard grow more thickly, uh, they get more bright-eyed, uh, and, and this is actually the historic, this is the beginning of blood, prior to this there is no science of blood transfusion, and they have no science, they don't know what blood groups are. So unfortunately, one of the early pioneers uh, dies of a blood transfusion, either because he gives himself a blood transfusion from someone with the wrong blood type, or because he gives himself a blood transfusion from someone who has malaria, uh, or clearly a bad idea. Uh, but we owe these guys a real debt in that they, they do the science, what we know about <laughs> some of what we know about blood transfusion. The, so the Russian Institute of Blood Transfusion is is founded around this time, but they but they carry on that you know they carry on to a certain extent with these ideas, and there's phys the physical manifestation of it is presently in Red Square in Moscow today, where if you go, you will see the embalmed body of Lenin. Uh, the father of the Soviet Union, and Lenin's body initially was was going to be preserved in a, was going to be refrigerated, uh, and refrigeration was a, was was a, obviously it's obviously a good way of preserving things. But the re the refrigerating units that they brought from Germany broke down. Lenin started to go off, and so they had to try and preserve him in another way. And I think the the the, the ultimate goal was to bring Lenin back and have Lenin have Lenin around, uh, the, the once and future Lenin, uh, which isn't what Fyodorov wanted. Fyodorov wanted everyone to have a shot at immortality. And... Uh, I mean, you, one of the main characters, well, one of the, one of the characters in this book is, is Vera, and she's the one who, who writes the code, and she's Russian, and she knows this, this his, the, 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 right. the researchers and the, the team... Um, the 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 Mal Malvan Malvan I love Ma his yeah Malevin it would be Mal but Malevin yeah yeah but I love that kind of uh, nod to the you know the bad yes Mal right uh, and and um and he, he and his his cohort um Hunter Gould yes sounds ghoulish but um uh, they uh, who uh, who works for Inside Out Records you know get it well Hunter and, uh, Hunter's <laughs> a, oh, I never thought about that that's accidental actually uh, but uh, Hunter's um Hunter's a very rich American and 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 that's another of the weird places where this touch his reality. Hunter is someone with as much money as you could possibly imagine, and he has made very canny investments and end up uh, a, a, a software uh, and m money from the music industry and uh, the kind of uh, an AI. Uh, and actually, at the time I finished the book, uh, Google announced that they were setting up a subsidiary called Calico. The point of Calico, the stated aim of Calico is to investigate life extension technologies, which is precisely what uh, Hunter's aim in, is in this book, is to investigate ways for us to live much, much longer. And the Russian cosmists, who, who give birth to a number of either, other things besides blood transfusions, also the father of the Russian space race, or the Soviet space race, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, was a, was a cosmist. And he came up with the the uh, formulae that were used to set, send the Sputniks into space. But the, the, the cosmists have, have now changed into something else. They've changed into what we tend to refer to as transhumanists. I don't know if it's a word anyone's heard here. The transhumanists are a branch of philosophy stroke science who believe that by using science, we will transcend the limitations of being human. The limitations of being human are be, uh, getting sick and dying. So to me, the limitations of being human sound like pretty much the defining characteristics of being human. Yeah, when we were talking about this is, you know, doesn't, as we say, you know, this is a, a bit trite, but death defines us. If you, if you don't have death, you know, ahead of you, then you know what, you, you know that if you are going to die, you have a limited time to achieve a certain, you know, certain things in your life. If you know that you're going to, to live indefinitely, you know, What's the rush? You know, why bother to? You know, you, you're just going to live. And what? What? It changes our 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 perception of of ourselves, doesn't it? If we if we understand that we're going to live forever, then what 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 would compel us to? I often be wonder, actually, ambitious or achieve anything. I wonder if the audience, well, we could ask, we could ask them to yeah. vote whether they would like to live forever. Yeah. Hands That's up if you want to live forever, or hands up if you don't want to live forever. And hands up if you do want to. If you if it were possible to live forever. Literally, okay, one. Okay. Well, interesting. Maybe you're a software billionaire, sir. <laughs> Looking 
Yeah. But the, uh, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think a lot there, there, there is in, in, um, in California right now, there's a similar enthusiasm about the scope of technology that there was at the turn of the 20th century, I think. There, a similar optimism about science. I think if you've made a billion dollars with an algorithm for dispatching taxis to people, you might genuinely think that there's no problem that you can't solve. So why not see if you can live longer? But I mean, th this, I think it raises, of course, you know, moral issues as well. You know, who's the one who creates the new person? Who's the one who um, controls the environment? Where there's, you know, it gives somebody, it gives a certain group of people an immense amount of power. And, and what they do with that power is uh, anybody's guess, you know, and power corrupts absolutely, doesn't it? So and, pe and people already, and rich people already have more and better life than other than non-rich people, if uh, it would be uh, you know if if, uh, if a class of people manage to make themselves immortal, which they, which they won't, I don't think I just don't think it's possible. But for philosophical, my my philosophical instincts tell me that the guy who's behind this, uh, by the way, is a guy called Ray Kurzweil, who's a very interesting fellow. He's the father of transhuman, the present-day father of transhumanism. And right now, he's somewhere in California. He's taking and he's an advisor to Google. And right now he's taking a lot of dietary supplements and waiting with his fingers crossed for the singularity that will make, uh, at which point uh, technology will reach a kind of, um, this kind of threshold point at which it begins to replicate itself, at which, it, it, it's pro, at which the sort of graph of its development becomes vertical. It becomes kind of instantaneously uh, more complicated any, and v it sort of becomes unimaginably complex. And he's thinking that maybe he'll be able to have his consciousness uploaded onto the internet. Uh, God knows what that would be like. Uh, the other transhumanist solution is that we could become a, a we, our bodies would be replaced but our physical bodies would be replaced by a hive of nanobots. <laughs> so I think you've got to imagine someone being attacked by a swarm of bees and they're covered with a swarm of bees. <laughs> and that's but I mean, that's that, what you'd look that like. That takes away, you know, like, uh, there, you know, we, we all get pleasure out of the body, don't we? Well, if we're lucky. So, I mean, I suppose they would have to answer that question as well. How do we still, you know... Um, you don't need, a, you don't really need a body to play candy crush mm. for the for another 200 years uh. you know i mean it, you would possibly you'd be able to look at screens uh -huh. and uh you know and interact with uh, the internet right so you know i, I mean it, it's ironic but the 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 immortal the ideal immortal person from the point of view of you know silicon valley probably would be someone who would still be able to uh, consume <laughs> The products that they're facing, no, but no, you probably wouldn't be able to do tai chi, go for a swim, pick up your children, yeah, have a glass of wine, enjoy chana masala, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the thing about these people who, you know, the, these great experiments in, in, in Russian science or Soviet science, I mean, despite. Um, you know the horrible people dying. They did, you know, help us to understand the the usefulness of blood transfusions, right? Yeah. So, and these people who are have a lot of money and who are allowing themselves to imagine what we think is the unimaginable. Well, you know, what 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 gain are we going? We, we know it's it is it is exciting in, in yes, one it, way, isn't no, it? No, that's true. And bright people being given thinking outside the box always produces interesting. Uh, th even if they don't achieve the thing, their stated aim. The great example is Isaac Newton, right? Whose his main interest is alchemy. Isaac Newton's main thing is how how can we turn lead into gold? Uh, on on the way, he discovers you know the laws that gov govern uh, the physical world that we inhabit, and uh, you know trigonom uh, not, not trigonom and calculus. Uh. But uh, yeah, so 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 who knows what? Uh, they, I'm sure they'll you know with luck they'll produce things that would would benefit humanity. But I, I don't think. Uh, uh, l increased life for, uh, for, for billionaires is, is going to benefit anyone in this tent, sadly. No. Um, in, okay, uh, one more question and then we'll take it open to the audience, I suppose. Um, uh, <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, just give me a second here. Um, Soviet science and uh, living longer and um, 
and um, and oh yes, G- is it Gagarin who you yes. who you quote? Um, who 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 he he was the one who said, "Was the life of that dog worth?" the experiment uh, of sending him into yeah, space. Yeah, I right. mean, there's that other side of it as well, isn't it? That's like, right. Yeah. That was this after the, you know, the first, um, the Russians were, uh, the Soviets, I should say, more, were the, uh, led the world in the space race. And the first person, the first living thing that was sent into space was a dog, Laika. Of course, they didn't have any plans to bring the dog back. So uh, poor Laika was, went off into space and gave her life for the, but the chief scientist said uh, the life well, said it kind of wasn't <laughs> it wasn't worth the life of the dog, uh, which I di- I discovered at the end. It was sort of towards the end of writing the book. I thought I was kind of touched that he would say that it, because uh, we tend not to uh, be so sentimental about the lives of animals. But um, you know, uh, all these scientific things do regard sacrifices. But I. I, I the the and I and I think progress t- tends to come at questionable prices. I think we ha- have to be alive to them. And it, Dostoevsky said it more potently. He said the the happiness of all humanity is not worth the tear of a child, which is might might be putting it a bit extreme. But it's, I'm glad someone said it. Can I ask you about the ending of this novel? And as a you know the end justifying the means, you you had this in your mind the whole time, did you? This Nick's sort of rebirth. Yeah, I did. I. I it was a very. It, it was. A, I, I gra- it, it took me a long time to write the book, and I, I uh, because it was uh, because the narrative kind of fit, fits in. It, it, I'm going to make it sound more complicated than it really is. I hope that as a reading experience, it's pretty straightforward. But it, my dad said it was a kind of Chinese box, you know, a kind of one of those puzzles. I always um, thought that would be the uh, that shape of it. I, it was one of the. It was the first book that I wrote where I really knew the whole book before I wrote the book. And in a way, that made it worse. That made it much harder to write, because previously I would start with a paragraph that I lo- uh, was intriguing and a character, and then you just pursue the character. Once something, they go out to get it, and they end with a win, lose, or draw. And that's the all but inevitable shape of all stories. But this one was like kind of, you know, it was like a planning someone, it was like planning a state visit, you know, the... Prime Minister has to be there at 12 o'clock and the lunch at 3 o'clock and then they have to be here and it, half stuff has to fit together and intersect with other events. So it was a bit more, it was a bit more complicated. Do you think your TV and, and playwriting experience has informed your, write, your, novelist, your writing as a novelist? I, it definitely has and, and, it, and in a couple of ways. One is that it's made me interested in, I, I, I've been really lucky and I feel like I'm lucky for, for actually give me thanks for giving me a chance to say I feel very lucky to be here in Dhaka right now because I think we're all enriched by going to places and meeting other people and hearing other experiences and uh, luckily I'm blessed in my work in my other work as a as a journalist is, is I get to go to places and, and ask uh, intrusive questions of people and uh, I, I get to listen to their answers and I, I'm fe- I feel enriched by that but the other thing is working in uh, TV and film and interested in write, you know, screenwriting and playwriting is that um, I'm always thinking about a scene and I'm always thinking if you were to see that if you were if you were to film this what would you actually be looking what would you actually see and how could you show this on the screen and wh- when does a scene begin and when does it end and and how early uh, or uh, what's the what's the latest that you could really come into this scene and see the action and what's the earliest you can come out? And I think that's a very... And what's weird is then when you actually go and read great writers of the past who never, who would never have seen anything on TV, but when you read Dickens, or I really I noticed with Tolstoy, actually. And Tolstoy, War and Peace is a master... Is, there's a masterful... I know it's got a bad rap as being a long, boring Russian novel. Uh, but I think only the first uh, 100 pages or so really are somewhat boring. The rest is... Very, very short, vivid, cinematic scenes. And you think, how did he... Uh, think, yeah, like with Dickens, you don't necessarily think about the characters as much as the... Well, you do, of course, the characters, but the, the, but you know, how the much setting, you know, you're just there, aren't but you? But think and how much... He was crazy about the theatre. Mm. He was crazy about the theatre, and he acted the stuff out. I think he looked... He had a mirror, and he would pull faces in the mirror when he was describing a character, you know, Mr. Queeg... I, I don't know that my uncle told me that, and I believe everything my uh, my uncle tells me. So, and I'm sure I'm sure if my uncle said it, it's true. But yeah, he said that he, 
And if it's not true, it should be true, right? It's one of those things that, you know, let's, it's true if we make it true. I mean, there's a, I think you, you, you do yourself a disservice by saying this book is very straightforward because, I mean, I thought that was one of the joys of reading it. I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know, uh, you know, you know, of course, you, you ha it has a linearity to it. You know, where you're pulled through from the start to the finish, and you want to, you know, find out what's going on. Yeah. But it is, uh, as somebody said, it's a bit, you know, um, as this, this origami book. So you're always, you know, thinking, where is he going with this, and where is he going with this, and why is he, you know, showing us this? And, you, and then in the end, it all, all you go, oh wow, and mm -hmm. it all fits together, mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, well, it thanks. gives me thanks, chills. Kelly. Well, that's the. Well, I couldn't ask for higher praise. <laughs> so. And um, uh, can we say about the the deal you signed the other day? Is that yeah? Top we can. I don't. No, no. It's not secret. But I don't. You know. I don't think. I'm not. I, I was really lucky to, enough. Well, I've so, I've sold the. Uh, I've signed a deal to do the uh, for a TV adaptation of the book for, for a really good production company. But I, I, I what, Kelly, I was telling Kelly this. Obviously, I'm pleased. But uh, these things th take a long time to come. If to they fruition. ever happen, I, you know, they, I, I would hate to have to estimate the chances. I, I certainly oh. wouldn't bet my house on it happening. No, I was reading this book and I thought. This is so cinematic, or not necessarily cinema, but it's just so perfect for um, a TV adaptation because you know who's who's going to play the main character and and who were we saying the other day? Benedict Cumberbatch. But I don't think Benedict Cumberbatch. He's too. Nick is so kind of sloppy, and you know, he, he I don't know if he can be. Um, I wanted to, the, my great regret is that Philip Seymour Hoffman yeah, can't play Hunter he Gould. Would have he been, would have been really. Yeah. I think uh, he would have been good. It as, would have been as good Nick. Nick. Well, he would have been. Yeah, he yeah. was a very good actor. Yeah. yeah. So, shall we open up the audience, uh, or questions to the audience, shall we? Yeah, are you happy to? Yeah, happy, happily, yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. The mic, the mic's coming. Uh, I, what I see, what I have just come a few, about 10 minutes ago. I was hearing that you were talking about bloods and all that. But Dracula tried that. Yes. It wasn't successful, was well, it? Well, no, that's true. But, you know, that's so interesting that you should bring up Dracula because... <laughs> You know, the, so the so Dracula's written at the towards the end of the nineteenth century, yeah. and it is also a book about coming back from the dead. Yeah, in a way, right? But uh, it, it <coughs> didn't work out for Dac Dracula. It did, well, you know what? Coming back from the dead never works out. That's the <laughs> lesson that fiction tells us. It never works. You know, whatever the story is, it could be Frankenstein, it could be the story of the monkey's paw, where the where the where the they want to bring back their dead son, and then uh, they, he's been he's been. He's killed, been killed in a horrible industrial accident, and they're given a wish to yeah. bring him back from the dead. So they wish, oh, yeah. and Pets then they hear a, they hear yeah. a knock on the door, oh, my goodness. and he they was, think, "Oh and he my!" He was burnt and everything. He and was, when he used to come, he was just burning, and so he, was, they, he, was, he was really in terrible. So, terrible so they don't. State. So they, they have to. So the last wish is they wish him to go away. Yeah. So 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 yeah. it never works out. So that's the one of those wise things that fiction tells us that you know we perpetually forget. But the other thing is, you know, every age is interested in coming back from the dead. I mean, you go, if you go to the British Museum, as I often do, and look at the Egyptian uh, the preserved mummies, and you see they've all been pr preserved with their pots of perfume and yeah. their cats and their slaves yeah, because they want to come back from the dead. But then in the, in the early part of the... But all their inner organs. All their inner, inner organs inner. preserved in special <laughs> flasks. Special flask. But then in the early part of the 19th century, when Mary Shelley's writing Frankenstein, yeah. what's the great scientific hope of the early 19th century? It's electricity. Mm -hmm. Electricity is the great hope. So they think, well, you know, the secret of life is, is bound to be electricity. And so uh, Frankenstein is, Frankenstein's monster is reanimated with a massive bolt of lightning. By the, 19th, by the late part of the 19th century, they don't know, well, what, it's, what is it? It's uh, blood. So they, yeah. it's blood transfusion. Then the early part of the 20th century, refrigeration. Yeah. Uh, Walt Disney, the great myth maker, also wants to live forever. Walt Disney had his body cryogenically frozen. He, he, Walt Disney's corpse was <laughs> frozen solid, and people still doing this. Mm -hmm. not, not forgetting the basic science that water expands when it freezes. So if you get frozen, all your tissue is going to be destroyed. This is why food doesn't taste as good <laughs> yeah. when it's been frozen. Yeah. But thinking, well, probably the, you know, science will be able to solve that. And what's the great scientific hope now? Computers. So that's where the so that's the great promise of of eternal life. No, or you can, people can do what John Collins does: cell therapy. Cell therapy. Well, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah. And it'll be something else in a few years. But you're absolutely right. You know, Dracula illustrates a very important point about eternal life. 
<laughs> that we that we always infatuated with it and that it never turns out well. Yeah, yeah that's Thank why you for your question. these are all, you know, called horror stories. You know, you see all the, in the horror stories. The, the clues in the title, in the, in the genre. Um, I actually have two questions for you. Since you said you often look at your toes and you're amazed by how you own it, do you think that... Uh, do you just think that we are our bodies or are we more than our bodies? That's you, you know, that's such a good question. I think we're more than our bodies. I, I think, my, this is my intuition, and everyone in this room uh, ha must have their own answer. But I, I think we're kind of, in, I think we're involved with uh, each other more than we think. I think we are also the people we love I think we're also the people we hate, actually, very, very intimately. And I think we should really examine the people that we have negative feelings about. Uh, what, what, so that, yes, I, I think we're much more than our, our bodies. I, I think, I, I, don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know where we end, but it's further than people think. I don't take it that limited view. Okay, my second question is, do you think that you've been here before, like... I mean, is this Dhaka. no, no. I know I haven't as been in here before. This life, this life, as in this world, like. No, no, I don't. This is the first time. Uh, I, I think you know. I think I, I do. I like the idea that uh, <laughs> it's uh, that you that human that, you know that consciousness is like a wave. You know that it's like, it's like a wave that emerges from a big sea and then rejoins the big sea when it uh, when it ends. But uh, I don't. I, I I mean I don't know for sure. I, I you know I. I, I, I did recently went to, uh, Amer to, to, to write a story about ghosts. And I, I love ghost stories. Uh, I think ghost stories are fantastic. And, um, but I don't believe in ghosts. I mean, and I met, but I met loads of people in South Carolina and Georgia who had believed in ghosts. And I've got, I have got infinite time for hearing your ghost story. If you've got a ghost story, I'd love to hear it. Uh, but I always think, you know, there's going to be a better, there's another explanation. You know, that I saw people who had taken pictures of ghosts. I think it's your flash bulb of your camera. It's your, uh, you know, but I would love to the, I would love to see the proof. And the same with, uh, you know, being here before or life after death or any of these uh, kind of paranormal or quasi-religious experiences. I would love to see, I would love to be proven. I would love my... My skepticism is provisional. Who was it who said, um, I would give five years of my life to see a ghost? Because for him, that would prove that there is life after death, right? So um, I thought that was a very interesting... Yeah, yeah no, I think... Yes. Uh, I'm really glad you mentioned Ray Carswell's Singularity is Near. Oh, good. And uh, the idea of like, you know, so the human consciousness being you know, uploaded in a computer. In fact, like, you know, they have already done it with Alzheimer's patients, like, you know, I was told, so, like, you know, at what, least... What have, what have they done? UCLA, so they, with Alzheimer's patient, so they have tried to upload human brain into the computer. So, uh, how yeah. Did, how did that go? I, I've been told, like, you know, they are successful and they're, like, you know, 15 years, uh, you know, away from uploading the whole brain. That's University of California? Uh, yes, at, at Los, Los Angeles, Angeles yeah. UCLA. Uh, but my question was, like, you know, I was watching Interstellar, like, you know, going back to your idea of ghost, like, you know, and ghost you know, I haven't seen it, but I, I keep meaning to, so... Right. And uh, there is this uh, interesting observation that the whole Apollo expedition was, like, uh, you know, controversy, like, you know, it was, like, in you know, a hoax and all that. Well, it wasn't real. They, they, they did no it on a Apollo film set. They did like it on a film set, and, the, right. and if you look at the flag, it's clearly... Exactly, it's, waving. It's waving, and, like, you know, there's, and there's no wind on the moon. Right. But the observation was like, you know, they're trying to change the textbooks and because the whole idea was to drain out uh, the Russian resources. So right. getting the Russians involved in like, you know, spacecraft and sending Laika abroad, you know, over space and all that. So what's your take on that? Well, uh, that's the history's back to front, isn't it? Because the Russians were first in space and it was the, the Russians beat the Americans to the punch. And the, uh, the U.S. got into an absolute uh, panic about it. And then so Kennedy launched the race as a way of uh, get, getting equal with the Russians. And uh, so, so uh, I mean, I think they didn't need to, they, 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 the R Russia bankrupted itself. And, the, you know, I think there was an element of economic warfare with Russia, but I think it was more overt that the uh, arms race also bankrupted Russia. The American economy was so much more efficient than the Russian one that it was able to afford the much greater military spending as a smaller percentage of its GDP. So, 
and you no, know, I don't believe that the Apollo landing was a hoax. Uh, but uh, but and that's probably a separate conversation. Um, uploading the, but it's fascinating what you say about uploading the somewhat an Alzheimer's patient's consciousness onto a uh, onto a computer. Now I would quibble that their consciousness was uploaded onto perhaps. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of Im one could imagine it's imaginable that you could be you your your memory your failing memory could somehow be bolstered. Maybe you could ex store memories on an external thumb drive. Maybe you could transfer memories from one person to another. D th this is easily imagined. You know why? Because we're already doing it. We transfer memories from one person to another through the form of a book. And we, 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 we bolster our failing memories by writing things down and looking at them later. So I, I wonder if this is a quant... I don't think this is a huge leap from that. But the idea that someone's entire consciousness is put onto a computer, uh, it, uh, I have a, it, to me, there, there's that, there, there's that philo the philosophical question it raises is, how is my consciousness separate from my body? Yeah, so what, 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 something of me is going to be lost. When I, but it's it's a fascinating area of research, and I'm glad you mentioned Ray Kurzweil because, you know, if it, he's one of these people of whom we might say if he didn't exist, we would have to invent him, because he raises so many important questions about what it what what it means to be human, what are the legitimate aspirations of science, what what consciousness properly is. You know, he's a he's a very important, thoughtful presence on the planet who may be here for some time. <laughs> Let's take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Front Last row. question. What does being alive mean to you? <laughs> what does what? What does being alive mean what to you? What does being alive mean being to alive you? Being alive mean to you. Wow. You know, I, I suppose uh, being alive to me and it's, I'm glad you, ra you asked the question in a way because I suppose I, um, it's one of the, th the deep reasons or it's one of the feelings that I hope people come away from my books with, which is a feeling of wonder and gratitude for being alive. Because, I, you know, sometimes I, the r books I write, they, they, you know, they seem a bit gloomy and strange on the surface. But I hope that you know, in the end, you get returned to the fact that being alive, that the pl our planet is beautiful, we're lucky to be here, we, it's finite, we, uh, we have a duty to each other to take care. You know, I, to, for me, it's just one, it's wonder, I think, is, is, is what being alive means. And I, and I have to say, I constantly lose sight of that because I constantly become impatient, you know, I'm rude, I behave badly, I'm not nice enough to my, you know, I'm not patient enough. And I think, so I constantly try and, and I think anyone, for anyone, this is a, you know, a struggle to return yourself to that central fact of gr kind of gratitude and wonder. Okay, I'd just like to, um, do you want to have one quick question? You said you want to raise your hand quickly. Just one more. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, to add to what he was saying, like kind of like a comment on that, is to say that uploading the conscious, uh, uploading a human brain onto the computer and to recreate a person is problematic because our behavior, the person that we are, is actually intimately tied down to the bodies we inhabit, down to our behavior being uh, manipulated by bacteria in our gut. So if I were to transfer the person that I am, just to upload a scan of my brain, for example, would not, in fact, recreate who I am. That's a very, very good point. That you're not just, you're not just. We, we are, we are the hosts of a number of other hmm. existences, right? Yeah. So, who exactly is a human being? Like it's the behavior of a multitude of organisms that are inhabiting a human body. And even if I were to uh, upload something, then what exactly would be uploaded? Like, is it an accurate, for example, for example, say? Would it not be easy to change? Like, I think, for example, that I am selfish or perhaps confident in some way, like I have this trait. So I would insist that this trait be represented in my scan, which may or may not represent who I am based on how... Maybe feel. you'd like to improve yourself slightly, or as you, before you get uploaded, you might, might want to do some cosmetic surgery on your personality. Perhaps. Be tweaked. Or perhaps that I have this sense of who I am that may not 
entirely match with how other people see me. Almost certainly the case, yeah. right? Does, yeah. it, does anyone's sense of who they are match with how other people perceive them? I, I'd say almost in 100% of cases, no. So ultimately, the question comes down to is that who is being uploaded and is this really who I am? Well, I think that, that uh, you know, I can only, I think that's, those are great questions to conclude on. I don't know the answer. I, I think in the, the strange bodies, I suggest that the, what comes into being is a different creature, but one that's also entitled to life, which is the same thing that you get in Frankenstein, that the, the monster, a, a, a living creature comes into being, but it's monstrous. And yet it's sort of entitled to, 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 to compassion and life. We end up creating more things, but they're different from what we intended. Because I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I just want to close with one, one of the quotes from your book, and then I'll, I'll say uh, something quickly, quickly. It says, uh, you say here, and yet here is a paradox. You're talking about that this is Nick, the main character, speaking, and towards the end, I think it is. And he says, and yet here is a paradox. paradox while no longer myself, I have never felt so clearly myself. I feel closer at any time in my life to perceiving the truth of the universe, the penumbra of sacred feeling which rings the real, which constitutes the real, without which we are so much meat and bone whizzing through space. Mono no aware, the Japanese call it, that feeling over things which suffuses their art with stoic melancholy the only true response to the transience and beauty of our experience. So this book is, you know, it just like inhabits your soul. And I think, you know, you must turn the page on the Thoreau family. And this is the writer that you need to be reading That's here, Marcel sweet. Thoreau. Thank Please raise a hand for Mr. Thoreau. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you for having me here.